pre-synodal rhetoric is ramping up as we approach the consistory of new cardinals on September 30th and the start of the Synod on Synodality in October, while a disgraced priest is being rehabilitated in Rome. Here with their reaction and analysis to what we're now calling Synod Central is the Papal Posse. Editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, joins me on set, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Thank you both for being here, gentlemen. Um, since we have the full posse, and we're calling this the Synod Central, I want to get to the latest news. The Vatican just released a new list of invitees to the Synod, including a pair of mainland Chinese bishops, one of whom is an official of the government-run church, and Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia. He is the head of the Pontifical Academy of Life. We are told that this is the whole church walking together. What are we seeing here, and what do these additions tell you, Robert Royal? Well, I suppose at this point it doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but the fact that there has been such a troubled relationship between the Vatican and China, despite what the, the, what the Holy Father said uh, during his trip to Mongolia yeah. a few weeks ago, um, these two bishops, unlike the other two bishops from China, there's one from Hong, Hong Kong and one from Taiwan, who are pretty good guys by and large, but these guys were selected by the Pope from a list mm. that was presented to him by the Chinese Communist Party, the, the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association, which is very close, of course, to the regime. Yeah. So those two, I think we can count on being a, a bit of, a, of uh, trouble. Palia, of course, has had a, a storied career. Uh, when he was the Archbishop of Terni, he uh, did this uh, homoerotic, he had this homoerotic painting done for the cathedral there. He's basically wrecked the John Paul II Institute and the, the uh, Pontifical Academy for Life. So. His voice is not going to be a, a welcome voice, at least for me, when he, he's in the, that room. Mm -hmm. But there's so many other people, and we'll see, you know, we'll, yeah. I hope we'll begin to see, because a lot of the, the, the uh, d deliberations are going to be very much kept yeah. under wraps. Father, the Vatican also announced the addition of a Sister Mary Teresa Barron. She's the president of the International Union of Superiors General, a progressive association of nuns. There seems to be one cast of mind among all these invitees. Your thought? Yeah, when I read the list of invitees, I don't see some names of people that I would have chosen to be there, be they academics, religious, uh, bishops. You know, I'm very disappointed that Robert Cardinal Sara is not there. He's one mm. of the most outstanding African bishops and cardinals. He writes wonderful books. Uh, he should be there. That's very disappointing. Cardinal Burke. Uh, who is one of the best experts in canon law that we have, he's not there. There are a lot of people who should be there. I'm afraid, though, that uh, the guest list is basically determined by the likelihood of supporting radical change in the church, and that's a great concern to me. Mm. Uh, more news we have to get to. A Bishop Alfredo de la Cruz of the Dominican Republic is also among the invited to this synod by the Pope. He is now saying, and this is startling, he says, quote, we must first distance ourselves from everything that fundamentalism signifies. That would be the first temptation we would have, to believe that doctrine can't be touched. Doctrine is there in order to reflect, to see. When we often say that doctrine can't be touched, the Pope has pointed out the temptation of backwardness. Rather, they don't go to the doctrine as such, but to the ways in which we express and live the faith, end quote. Father, I'll let you react to that first. Well, I have to say this is most regrettable, even disgraceful. Uh, the duty of a Catholic bishop is to uphold the teaching of the apostles and the solemn magisterium of the church, the teaching office. To say that doctrine can be touched, what he means is doctrine can be changed. Uh, and to say that holding fast to the faith that, you know, has been handed down from the apostles is, is a backward looking view. Uh, this is destructive. I know what's going on here. I think most of our viewers do, too. In order to change Catholic teaching on some matters that are of great sensitivity at the moment, you have to first tell people, oh, don't get worried about a change. That's part of what it means to be a Catholic. Yeah. No, it's the other way around. Being a Catholic means the truths handed on are defended mm -hmm. against trendy notions which contradict the faith. So this bishop is very disappointing. He needs to reform that manner of speaking because... The job of a bishop is not to tear down the teachings of the church, but to uphold and defend them. Yeah. 
Bob, this synod participant, Bishop de la Cruz, he went on. He said, and God spoke to us concretely through Jesus at one time. He took up truths that in his time were difficult to address, yet he dared. I believe that we have to have the strength of Jesus, that daring, that ability to dare, to propose things that have not been proposed. Robert Royal, what is he setting up? What expectations is he setting up for this synod? Yeah, you know, despite what many of the, the synod leaders, the organizers have said, this is a very radical statement that we're getting. I'm starting to feel that the, the, the repeated invocation of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is actually setting up an opposition between the Holy Spirit and Jesus, because some of the hard sayings that Jesus put forward, for example, the indissolu indissolubility of marriage in his own time, people, even his own disciples reacted to that, yeah. those are precisely the things that are being challenged at this point. So mm -hmm. I, I recall when we, we were all sitting in Philadelphia in 2015 at the, uh, the World Meeting of Families, and the gospel for the mass in Philadelphia was about the indissolubility of marriage. And the pope at that point had an astonishing rereading of that, that uh, passage as if it didn't say what it said. So if you want to be radical, let's be radical like Jesus. It's not that the Holy Spirit is going to revise what Jesus said. <laughs> It should inspire us to actually follow what yeah. he said. They all seem to be looking for a rewrite from the Holy Spirit here, Father Jerry. Um, which, uh, the, and what that bishop is saying seems to fly in the face of what we heard from Cardinal-designate Victor Manuel Fernandez, the new head of the Vatican's doctrinal office. He assured our Edward Penton that the synod is not about changing doctrine, but, always beware of the but, Here's the quote, the doctrine does not change, the gospel will always be the same. Revelation is already settled, but there is no doubt that the church will always be tiny in the midst of such an immensity of truth and beauty and will always need to continue to grow in her understanding. He then added that obedience is needed to what he called the doctrine of the Holy Father. Are they setting up a dichotomy here, Father Jerry, between the doctrine of faith, the doctrine of Christ, and the doctrine of the Holy Father? Well, in cases of contested doctrines, that may be what's going on here. You know, the typical statement is, the truth is fine, the way we express it is not, and therefore we have to change the way we express it so it'll be more appealing. Well, the people who contest the teaching want us to reject it. Uh, this is a perfect example is what's going on in Germany with the blessing of homosexual unions. How are you going to change the prohibition of committing immoral sexual acts uh, in such a way as to rephrase it so that people who think that's good are going to accept it? They're never going to accept the teaching until they change their hearts. They need a conversion of heart. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this is a typical tactic in debating church teaching, which is to say, the church teaching is fine, it's just incomplete and needs to be rephrased, i.e., as you just said, rewrite the script. Yeah. Uh, that's not what we do in Catholicism. The yeah. script's given from God, we obey it. Well, Father, one can only hope the Holy Spirit is part of the writer's strike. Bob, you wanted to react to this. Yeah, you know, I'm struck by the way that this dialogue always seems to go in one direction. I remember back during the 1980s, there used to be a Christian Marxist dialogue going on, and mm -hmm. a number of my friends from Latin America would say to me, you know, this is a dialogue between two different sides, but somehow, at the end of the day, Christians start becoming Marxist rather than Marxists start becoming Christian. <laughs> if there were real dialogue, in, 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 if we were really pursuing something new, I think we would find language that maybe would convert some of the people who seem to think that progressivism is where inevitably the church ought to be going. Mm -hmm. If someone stood up in the midst and said, you know, it, it's clear to me that, for example, the trans craze is crazy and we must reaffirm the, the, that human beings are built in a certain way. They were given bodies for a reason by God. I don't think we're going to see any of that type of dialogue going on. Mm -hmm. If there is, I'd be very yeah. grateful to see it. But I think dialogue is actually one of these words or this, this boldness is a term that is inevitably setting up progressivism, not real talk. It's also selective reading of the Gospels. I mean, it's like saying, you know, you, you should be pouring water at a well every afternoon and missing the entire lesson. In a recent interview, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who will be a participant in the Synod on Synodality, had this to say when asked about the secrecy that might be imposed on the participants of the Synod. He said this, this is a great hour of manipulation, of propaganda, of an agenda that does more harm than good to the church. Father, Cardinal Mueller also stated that he will, he at least uh, will be there to, in his words, commit to doctrinal clarity. 
your thoughts and explain, if you will, this attempt to invoke the pontifical secret on the entire gathering here. Can it be applied? Well, yes, that was what was brought forward at an earlier press conference by the Synod officials. The pontifical secret is something that's used in the Holy See to guarantee the integrity of internal discussions about papers that are being written, letters that are being sent, actions being contemplated. You know, when a bishop is nominated uh, to become a bishop, there's usually a lag time before he can announce it publicly. In the meantime, he's under the pontifical secret. It's not meant to be revealed. Now, applying it to a synod, which is supposed to be a meeting where all the church is getting together to find out what it means to work together, and then suddenly saying, well, everybody in the synod room is, is taking a vow of silence by simply being there. As soon as they leave the room, they can say nothing. This is contradictory. I think it is a manipulative technique. I think the press office at the Synod is going, unfortunately, basically be running interference against mm. the media and against people who want to know what's going on by saying, well, it's all there. We can't manipulate it. One thing that's been said, the Pope says that there's got to be a measure of secrecy and privacy in order to have honest discussions. And I'm saying to myself, usually in the real world of politics and, and courtrooms, introducing cameras kind of brings more truth forward because people know they'll be held accountable for what they say. So I hope and pray that that pontifical secret is not imposed. And this on a practical level, leaking goes on at the Vatican, just like it does in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be basically another manipulative effort. So uh, much better that people be given the freedom of the children of God to speak boldly on the Senate floor and then boldly when they stand in front of a camera. Uh, yeah, Bob, it, it is curious. We're, we're supposedly having this moment where we're listening as a church, yet don't talk back. Just shut up. You're not allowed to say anything inside or outside of the meeting room. That's, that's going to be a problem for you trying to cover this. Yeah. Look, the Holy Father has said this is not a parliament. It is not a debating society. It is not a democratic event that, that is going on. But other than the prayer that seems to show up periodically, there's supposed to be, as I understand the structure, there'd be three or four brief presentations, interventions, maybe they call them, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a three-minute or four-minute period of prayer along the whole way. Now, that's, that's fine. But as Father rightly says, you've got 400 people in a room. People take an oath not to reveal what happens during a conclave that actually elects a pope. And still we find out how the, the votes actually took place. So it will be impossible, and we ought to be very careful. I'm certainly going to be very careful. We're both, Father and I are both going to be over in Rome and doing podcasts for the Catholic thing. Um, people leak, and they leak to certain journalists because they want a certain narrative to right. begin to take place. So we're going to have to be, instead of getting the, from the horse's mouth, from the actual Vatican, yeah. we're going to be hearing from different favored journalists yeah. who are going to have agendas. Well, and, and that's, but that's the only way you're going to get any news out of this thing because of the way it's being structured. And I'm being told, this could be a rumor, but I'm being told, they are at the moment considering doing only one press briefing at the end of each week right. as a synthesis of what happened there. Before we go on, I want to say something that I've been studying the Synod, watching it evolve. There are all sorts of what I consider wild distractions coming from various sectors of the church. One bishop suggests ordaining women, another suggests blessing gay unions. These are kind of red herrings, I think, sort of outlandish suggestions to shift our focus from the larger issue, that is, the remaking of the structure and decision-making of the Catholic Church. What we are about to see is a new model of governance in the Catholic context. We have seen this type of structure destroy the Anglican Communion, the Lutherans, and other groups, but they never claim to have the Vicar of Christ as their head. What we are witnessing, with papal approval, is a long-sought structural change. The shift is the transformation of a synod, a body of bishops, to a grouping of anybody with decision-making power. That is significant. Whatever they decide is less important than the fact that they are deciding at all. The establishment of this structure is the whole game. Don't miss that point. For instance, Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago tweeted this, and I want your reaction, Father. He, he tweeted something from the International Theological Commission, and I'll sum up. He said, from a theological and, and canonical point of view, synodality denotes those structures and ecclesial processes in which the synodal nature of the church is expressed as at an institutional level. And he goes on to mention structure, structure, structure. Is this what we're looking at here? 
a radical transformation of the structure of the church. Uh, some would like that, but it's impossible because this, the church is established by Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God made man. Uh, therefore, the nature of the church is not a human accomplishment. The apostles didn't get together and say, let's organize this thing according to the following criteria. No, Jesus picked 12 apostles, and then he gave them the power to rule over the flock. They're the shepherd. Remember, Jesus is the good shepherd, and the apostles are the shepherds that c care for the church after the Lord ascends into heaven. So that can't be changed. Now, some people say, oh, yes, lay people can be involved in decision making. Well, lay people are not the shepherds in the church. In order to become a shepherd of the church, you have to be ordained a priest and then consecrated a bishop. Uh, the bishops are the leaders of the church. Now, do they rely on the help of other people? Absolutely. Yeah. Expert advice. By the way, lay people provide the model of sanctity that inspires the clergy, so that's very important. But yes, you're right, Raymond. Uh, when the Pope said that lay people would be at the Synod with an equal vote because he said there were no second-class citizens in the church, I think that's a profound misunderstanding, and I regret to say that. Mm. We do not consider uh, laity second-class or second of anything. Yeah. We're all equal through our baptism, sons and daughters of God. But Jesus established a way of living in the church, and that is yeah. these shepherds rule the sheep. No, we have our role. Yeah, Father, it would be like Rebecca and I inviting you into our house to settle a dispute, whatever you say we'll go with in the family. No, 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 no. You run the church. I run the family. I mean, that's how this works. Bob, let's talk for a moment about the, the, everyone keeps invoking the Holy Spirit. We're listening to the Holy Spirit together. Who's to determine that what they vote on as a group is indeed the Holy Spirit? And if the Pope affirms it, is that case settled? I pray to God that it's not settled, because I, I think that that will cause more difficulties inside the church than what, I, at least on the surface, he's trying to resolve by having this conversation take place. Look, you brought up the question of the government of the church, and I think that is a, a brilliant and central point, because this structure of the synod, as we've been told by Eastern Orthodox um, bishops, is not the classic structure of of uh, a synod as it was understood in the East. When the Pope proposed this synod, he said, we're, we're recovering an ancient tradition yeah. that we've lost in the West, but they have in the East. Well, he comes forward and he says, look, we have never had lay people voting in a synod. A synod is a bishop of bishops, is a, a, a group of bishops meeting together to decide about the church and prefer precisely the reason that Father was just talking about, right. that they have been given that role. And so the, 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 the attempt to call this a synod makes it into something that has never existed in the church and I think probably is, is a greater risk than it is a benefit. But we'll see as things develop. Well, you, you are seeing, Father, um, Heidi Schlumpf over at uh, the National Catholic Reporter pushing de women deacons and, and female priests, and that should be considered at the synod, she says. Um, th these are settled matters. I mean, this has already been discussed and settled, yet you have these cottage industries now lobbying the synod, and that's what we're hearing, all this banging from the outside. Canonically, how binding is a decision by this synod? Or do we not, are we on uncharted territory here because they've warped the initial and traditional vision of what a synod was to be? Well, it is changed. Bob's right. And uh, as you're pointing out, this is a serious, serious problem for the church because if people think that in the future, bishops can't decide anything without having lay people vote in favor of it, then we've got a problem because that's not how the church is run. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no doctrinal authority for anything that comes out of the Senate. It's simply an advisory matter submitted to the Pope, up to the Pope to determine uh, whether he wants to give this as part of his magisterium. And I certainly hope that this, you know, as you say, these campaigns for women priests and deacons, I hope that doesn't get center stage, but I think it will because I'm afraid there are a lot of people going to be in that synod hall and think that it's unjust that the Catholic Church doesn't ordain women. Uh, the using the deacon thing is the opening wedge mm -hmm. uh, because they'll say, well, you know, we had deaconesses in the early church. Why can't we have them again? Deaconesses were not deaconess. Deaconesses right. did not enjoy the sacrament of holy orders. 
And of course, as the church teaches, we have seven sacraments. We don't have nine because the sacrament of holy orders is one. So if you give part of the sacrament of holy orders to, the, to women as deacons, you basically authorize them to be ordained priests and bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, the, let's say, unspoken way that the, this is going on. We're going to start with deacons, but go to priests. You know, th Raymond, this is revolutionary stuff. We should not be talking about it. This matter has been studied in the Vatican in previous pontificates. Even this pope has had two right. commissions on women deacons. Uh, we don't know the results of them. We know the Pope said there was no unanimity. Well, the reason there's no unanimity is because you can't satisfy radical claims by saying, yes, this is in accord with tradition and the nature of the sacraments. It's not. So I, I hope and pray that that endorsement of women deacons it, it never happens because that would be a cause of grave, grave scandal and yeah. schism but in again, the church. We're, we're, we're talking say, about, but Father, the, again, we've been, we've mm -hmm. fallen into the trap here. We're talking about female ordination. That's not what this is about. This is about governance of the church. See, I don't think, I don't think there will be a proclamation to ordain women coming out of this, but I do think this is the predicate and the pattern for church governance from now on. That is far more disturbing, frankly, Father, to me as a layman than uh, wild claims of ordaining women or blessing gay marriages. All of that will happen in time if this is the structure you set up, Bob. Yeah, and you know, you've talked about these cottage industries that yeah. various people with, with certain agendas are putting forward. Well, this very debate now is, is coming back on, on the, the papacy itself because we're starting to see people raise the question about how should the next pope be elected? Right. Because after all, this idea of a conclave is, you know, a hundred and some odd very old cardinals who have <laughs> not been elected by anybody, don't represent anybody. And in secret, they choose this guy. What life do they know? Yeah, and what do they know? And in secret, they select this guy who's the next pope. So uh, it, when it starts to even get to the point that you're questioning how the guy who has proposed this is going to be, uh, right. his successor is going to be elected, we're really in, in totally right. radical territory. Uh, we are running very short on time, so I have to get to this. There is, and I see it in the media, and again, I'm trying to cut through all of this for you, the viewers. You're living your lives. People, you know, I had a reporter ask me, are Catholics and traditional Catholics and faithful Catholics engaged? I said, they don't know this is going on, but it is going on and it will affect them. And in the media, they're attempting to create this fake war between Pope Francis and what they call conservatives. And I'll read you the copy here. Hold on, I'll find it. Uh, here it is. The New Yorker. Uh, the Pope's coming Vatican showdown with American conservatives. And, of course, we're invoked. Cardinal Burke is invoked. Um, the EW10 is called a traditionalist network. Again, they're setting up a paper tiger. We're nothing. I'm reporting and asking questions. We're entertaining questions about this. Father, is, when did it become sinful to ask legitimate questions within the Catholic family, the people of God, looking at what's happening around them and just asking for sensible answers that fit with the tradition we're all a part of. That became a problem when radicals seized power in the church. I mean, you, when you have bishops who are saying things that contradict the Catholic faith, such as the Archbishop of Berlin or Cardinal Marx or others, uh, then what happened? When you contradict them, you are being categorized as an enemy of the church because the bishops are in charge. Well, we all know who's in charge of the Catholic Church. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We are all servants and instruments. Now, for the Pope to tolerate the Archbishop of Berlin and others to promote things that are immoral, this is where church order breaks down. Hmm. Uh, St. Athanasius was not a conservative in the political sense when he fought the Arian heresy. He was an Orthodox Christian who hmm. wanted heresy to be extirpated from the life of the church. Hmm. Similar now, if, if people come up and say, Father, you have to agree to be supporting women priests or you're a radical and an ideologue, I'll say, stop it. That's not what it is. I'm a Catholic. I believe in the Catholic mm -hmm. faith. This has been the teaching of the church. So, yeah. you know, it's fun to be a Catholic because we know the truth and it brings joy, but at times they're going to be anguished when people contradict it. Yeah. I have to move on before we run out of time. There have been a series of visitations um, of uh, Bishop Strickland down in Tyler. We read stories of the Vatican leaning on Archbishop Gomez and Bishop Van in Southern California over celebrations of the traditional mass in their diocese. Yet, this week, Rome is doing a full recovery mission 
on this disgraced sexual predator, Father Marco Rupnik. He's that Jesuit artist who's, by the way, his art is still all over the Synod, all over their releases and all over the Vatican. He was formally excommunicated in 2020 for giving absolution to one of his victims, which was lifted by the Pope. He was formally expelled from the Jesuits this past July. Now it seems the Diocese of Rome is expressing what it's called well-founded doubts about that 2020 excommunication decree. Bob, your take on this and the overweening indulgence of a man who lured nuns into sexual acts I can't even speak of on this air. Listen, this is a man who not, it wasn't just two or three cases. Right. This is at least a dozen, maybe two dozen women, religious women that he abused. He talked about, he, he tried to talk them into things that rightly we cannot talk about, but they were blasphemous. Horrible. A absolutely terrible thing. At least one man has also come forward yeah. as, as uh, having been attacked by him. So his guilt, it seems to me, seems uh, seems evident. Mm -hmm. The fact that, that, that this group, the Saleti group, and then the... Um, the Diocese of Rome have come forward and said that there were irregularities in the way that this was handled and that there are ambiguities and there, there isn't proof of what happened. Well, yes, there were ambiguities and there were irregularities because it was very badly handled by everybody in the Vatican, including, I'm sorry to say, the Holy Father, because the Holy Father has been able to move very swiftly on something that he wants to have happen, you know, suppressing the, the traditional Latin mass or whatever it might be. In this case, he claimed to, to keep hands off. I don't know why exactly. Maybe Rupnik is a friend of his. Oh, Rupnik maybe, is a friend of his. That's the staff. Well, I mean, maybe yeah. they, there's this, this personal connection. But we've seen him do this also with other people like Zanchetta from, oh. from Argentina. Mauros. It, it's, it creates a, uh, a further scandal in a papacy that wants to pr promote zero tolerance of, of abuse within the church. To have a, a high up friend, an artist of, who's a friend of the pope, receive this kind of personal treatment, this, this, mm -hmm. this personal indulgence. And lots of people are saying, I, I don't know exactly how to connect the dots about this, but lots of people are saying that the Diocese of Rome is speaking in the, basically in the name of the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have tried this rehabilitation unless he was on board with Father, it. Father, I'm giving you the last word. And connect this, if you will, to what we're seeing, the blitzkrieg, if you will, against traditionally minded bishops who really were just tending their flock. I mean, these are hardly flamethrowers or conservative traditionalists or radicals by any means, but they are being thrown out of office or quickly, you know, when they hit 75, it's like the chute opens on them. Yet this guy, Rupnik, gets the mercy of the ages. Well, you know, the Rupnik case was judged by the Jesuits. It was judged by the, the CDF, the Doctrine of the Faith. This guy's guilty. He's guilty. He was unrepentant. He wouldn't part. The Jesuits summoned him and he wouldn't participate in the process. So they threw him out. He should have been prosecuted by the Vatican and thrown out of the priesthood. Instead, now we have this thing going on. Yeah. Right now, canon law is in crisis in the church because it's invoked selectively. Uh, and then there's no transparency on how it's being applied. Uh, you know, Bishop Strickland, as we talked about last week, he's mm -hmm. under investigation, but we don't know what. Uh, the bishop in Puerto Rico, Fernandez from Arecibo, he was thrown out of, the, of his diocese by the pope without any explanation. Uh, this is not right. This, in the Catholic Church, the shepherds form a college. They work under and with the pope. But there should be a level of respect. Only when you commit canonical crimes or you're inc incompetent, incapable of carrying out your duty, should you be removed. Uh, it's very troubling because it's quite clear. Uh, the Bishop of Berlin says heretical things. He's still in position. The Bishop in, of Tech, Tyler, Texas, Bishop Strickland, he's now on tenterhooks because he's being accused who knows what, and he's done nothing wrong. So th th we have a big problem here, Raymond. We have to pray that this peace be restored because this is not, the Catholic Church is not meant to be a debating society in which people with power slam the people they don't agree with, but that's what it's become. Hmm. I wish we had more time. We will leave it there. Gentlemen, we thank you. Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray will be podcasting from Rome in October throughout the Synod. Visit thecatholicthing.org for more information and their usual sterling commentary. Thank you, gents. Synod Central will resume soon.